I've got an armory face on because I just took one of the treats. <laughs> it's like, oh, only 14 seconds left, too, Pastor. Well, good morning, everyone. Good morning. <laughs> For those of you that are here watching online, we welcome you as well. Uh, please let us know that you're here by giving a shout out in the comments. Um, just a few announcements. Oh, okay, we got a lot of announcements, but. Um, as we get started this morning, we are going to be continuing the Chosen uh, study series this Wednesday night with episode four of season three. I made the mistake of rushing the trailer for season four this weekend. It's not a mistake, but it generated a lot of emotion. We're in for a really interesting uh, upcoming season after the first of the year next year with that. But this upcoming uh, this episode is part one of a two-part uh, episode called Clean. And it's going to be the two by two the disciples carry out Jesus' mission. So if we think back a couple of episodes, we saw Jesus telling them that they were going to go out two by two and share the message. Well, this actually we get to see that in action as they carry out his mission to heal, cast out demons, and preach Jesus' words. But upon returning, they struggle with understanding what happened. And Simon and Eden have an additional struggle as they struggle to reconnect. And for any of you that have been away from a loved one for any amount of time, whether it's a few days, a week, a couple of weeks, you realize that when you come back together, there can be some, some struggles with that. So that we'll get to catch up with that. Certainly, if you need to catch up on the series, Get it on your phone if you've got a smartphone or a tablet, or you can just go online and watch it uh, right from angel.com. There's also plenty of streaming services like Prime, and uh, no, I don't think Hulu has it, but um, Netflix also has it, so you can keep up that way as well. We still have a couple week break yet before we have our next event, which will be the men's breakfast, which will be on Saturday, November 4th at 9 a.m. I'm not sure if we'll have bacon this time or not. I think I like the, the graphics, so I think maybe we'll get some bacon and throw it on the grill. Bacon Monday. You know, and it doesn't even have to be, you know, we don't have to cook it right for all. We get that pre-cooked and just warm it up like we did the sausage, so. Oh, Doug says, he, Doug is telling me right now he's going to cook the bacon from from raw. So you, you won't have to butcher it, but we'll let you cook it. Then that night, with, we're going to... With pleasure. <laughs> right. with, then that night, our third installment of the Chronicles of Narnia, we'll be watching The Voyage of the Dawn Treader. And uh, certainly if you uh, haven't seen the trailer for it, we'll watch that at the end of the service today. And for those of you on the we'll catch that in the... Uh, the playlist that'll be being put up. And then that night, so that Saturday is a busy, busy Saturday, but before you go to bed, when you get home from the movie, turn your clock back an hour. Get an extra hour of sleep. They can leave it that way if they want. But turn your clock back an hour. You'll be really early for church if you know. But one day, to just him, him being only two weeks out, thought about it, you know, better say something. So here we are. And then the following weekend, we have the season finales and the monthly races, the monthly November races. These are the trophies from each of the classes last year. So I thought I'd throw those up. I do not know what the new ones look. Richard, uh, one of the guys that helps with that, he handles that for us. You know, it's nice not having to do everything yourself. Oh. And he handles getting those for us uh, every year. And so he does a, a fantastic job of doing that. So I'm, I'm really looking forward to seeing what that looks like. Um, and we'll be doing that. 9.30 start time for registration. Race is at 10. Normally we get done 1, 1.30. Not that day. All the winners of the classes throughout the year, so it'll be 10 cars that have won throughout the course of the year that will do a double elimination to get car of the year uh, bragging rights. So. Uh, I've seen cars lose and then win their way back up and finish first. So it's kind of neat how that all can transpire. And then finally, Diane will be putting <coughs> our playlist into uh, the feed here this morning so that you can worship along with us in music after the live is over for the day. 
There is a lot been going on with our church family this week. Pastor Mark, as you will notice today, is not here. Um, and our prayer warrior, Denise, is also not with us today. We ask for prayers for them. Mark Bruce traveled, and certainly Denise, as they have some things going on this weekend. So let's calm ourselves, get ready for a time of worship. And our call to worship this morning will be coming from Isaiah 61, verses 1 and 2. And this is the celebratory part of this passage. But before we get there, Father God, we just thank you for the day. This is the day that you have made. Let us all rejoice and be glad in it. Father, let us hear the words that you have given for this message today. May they be words that resonate with us, words that we can hear. Maybe they will spark some questions or spark us into action. But whatever it is, Father, do not let those words remain dormant with us. We thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. So Isaiah 61, verses 1 and 2, and it says A because it's only going through the first part, and you'll find out more about why that is later. But it says, The Spirit of the Sovereign Lord is upon me, for the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to comfort the brokenhearted and to proclaim that captives will be released and prisoners will be freed. He has sent me to tell those who mourn that the time of the Lord's favor has come. Now this is getting towards the end of Isaiah's prophecies that started in uh, chapter 56 and run through 66. And these are prophecies that were meant for the exiles that would be returning from Babylon before the rebuilding of the temple that would happen in 520 BC. Now, here's the thing, and this is why he's still proclaiming these prophecies and still doing these teachings. The people, the Jewish people, they still suffer from idolatry. They still suffer from hypocrisy. They still suffer from indifference. Sounds a lot like people today. Isaiah's prophecies concerning their responsibility towards the glorious kingdom that is to come and the certainty of their arrival. And we will see that these prophecies, Isaiah wasn't sure if they were for him or if they were for something in the future. And we know today that those are fulfilled through the ministry of Jesus Christ. Now Isaiah, this passage, uh, in verse 1 is a shadow or a forerunner of Jesus where it says, For the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He did that with Isaiah. Isaiah was bringing good news to the poor. But it would be Jesus who comes to comfort the brokenhearted and to proclaim that the captives will be released and prisoners will be freed. But he's not necessarily talking about the political prisoners. He's talking about the prisoners of our own hearts, the prisoners of our own minds, the prisoners of our own sin. That is what he frees us from. Psalm 918 reminds us that the needy will not be ignored forever, and the hopes of the poor will not always be crushed. See, through Jesus' death and resurrection, he inaugurated the day of salvation in which the gospel is preached all over the world, and those who were estranged can find peace in him. As you go along your walk, you will find peace through Jesus. I got a call from Amanda the other day, and she is in the hospital because her port is not working. They gave her a HEMA port up here, And we went up and visited with her yesterday. We were supposed to get together with her and the family. Her husband's on vacation. Um, but he was at home taking care of their not so little anymore. She's 12. But, or going to be 12 in January. Close enough. Mm -hmm. But he was taking care of her. So we got to spend a couple hours with her. And I could see the pain in her face. But I could also... I knew the hope that she had that Jesus was in control, that God was in control of the situation. And last night when she called us, I've never heard her cry on the phone.
but she was very close because she's coming off of the home dialysis and now she'll have to go in three times a week to get dialysis. And she's not looking forward to that, but she knows, she said, God has a plan. She's struggling with that plan. And as I've admitted to y'all before, she's the very first thing that I gave 100% to God. And I'm still able to give her 100% to God, and that's what we did yesterday. He is not going to let her be crushed. He is giving her the hope. A hope of, and, and when he's talking about the hopes of the poor, it's not just the poor monetarily, it's the poor in spirit. And he is giving that to her, and he's giving that to each one of us. He is our spiritual physician. Which brings us to, uh, not only is this the name of our most recent episode, it's the sermon title, it's Physician Heal Yourself. Now, some of you that are older may be remembering the older version of the Bible where it says, Physician, heal thyself. But I wanted to bring it up, and the, the chosen did as well as heal yourself because you can be healed. Now, I love the flashbacks in the chosen. And this one is another one where they're taking some creative license, but we flash back to two toddlers playing. And it's Jesus and his friend Laz. That's what he calls him. In the show, he calls him Laz. Just, you know how we, I sometimes call him Diane Die. He shortened the name, but it's Lazarus. And this, thing, this is the Lazarus who is the brother to Mary and Martha. This is the Lazarus that will be raised from the dead after four days. But they show him them as childhood friends and in this quick clip we see Joseph we don't get much about Joseph in the Bible but they bring him in and he greets his family upon returning home from work we immediately fast forward to the current day or Jesus's current day anyway and we see him walking down the street and knocking on the door he's coming <coughs> home to his Ema for Rosh Hoshanah and when he gets there, they share a meal. And I don't think he likes raisins based on what the conversation was because she had a loaf of, of bread with raisins in it, fresh out of the oven. If you've ever had fresh bread, you know it's how yummy that is. But they, have a, they, have, they talk, and we learn that Jesus' brothers, James and Jude, decided not to celebrate the holiday with their Emma or Jesus in order to avoid conflict. The, it's implied here that they are jealous of all the attention that he's getting. Have you ever been jealous of the attention someone gets? And, and I, I was talking to someone this morning about uh, the pitfalls of social media and the videos and everything online, but I ran across the video this week. It was a hundred year old man. He was a physician. And he was standing at this podium on the stage at his high school alma mater. They had just inducted him into one of the Hall of Fames that they had. And what did he say? It took me all these years to get inducted. It took a fellow classmate, but a much younger football player. His last name's Kelsey, you might know him. He plays on the Chiefs. He was inducted after 10 years of being out of high school. So what, it, jokingly, but half-heartedly, he said, maybe my fellow inductee can get me an autograph from Taylor Swift. So, yeah, a little bit of, that was a little bit of joking, but there's, how many times have we thought, boy, why did they get that? They didn't deserve that. Why are they getting all the attention? I did all the work. That's kind of what they were dealing with. Now, coincidentally, we're talking about Rosh Hashanah. This was just celebrated by the Jewish people two weeks ago on October 2nd, 3rd, and 4th. It's a three-day celebration. Rosh Hashanah is the Jewish New Year, and it commemorates the creation of man. In Jewish practices, the month 
are numbered starting with the spring month of Nisan, making Tishrei the seventh month. Tishrei is the month of Rosh Hashanah. So, the seventh month has the first day of the new year. Well, it's the first day of their new calendar year, even though it's the first day of the seventh month. But why the seventh month? Well, let me tell you. There are several different New Year's on the Jewish calendar. We can think of it this way. We have New Year's, so that's coming up a little too quickly. It'll be 2024 when we blank. But we also start a new year every August, September, when the kids go back to school. We started a new college football year a few weeks ago. And I'm just going to say, because everybody's thinking that Iowa did get robbed yesterday, but I digress. In Judaism, Nisan is the new year for the purpose of counting the reign of kings and months on the calendar. Elul, which is about August, is the new year for the tithing of animals. Shabbat 15 in February is the new year for trees, determining when first fruits can be eaten and etc. Tishri, or Rosh Hashanah, is the new year for years, when we increase the year number. And then there are also sabbatical and jubilee years that begin at this time. A little history lesson for you to under, help us understand. Well, we talk about cultural understanding a lot when we're trying to understand the Bible, and this is just another important piece to that. But in, in the show, Jesus asked Mary, after they've been eating a little bit and talking and catching up, if she knows where the box is. She probably had the same face that I had yesterday when Amanda was telling me about having to switch her dialysis because... On average, people on dialysis only live five to 10 years. It can be longer, and it can be shorter. It all depends on what happens next. It's a question that makes her very uneasy. She knows the significance. She lets him know that it's in his room. So Jesus goes to his room and as we've discussed before, the Jewish people, the livestock, did live in part of the house. So as he walks towards his room to climb up the ladder to his little loft space, there's a couple of sheep there. And as the chosen loves to do, they use this as an opportunity. And the sheep are named Cain and Abel. But he gets up into his loft and he's looking around and he looks over and he goes, oh, that hasn't gotten any bigger. But then as he's looking around and he's remembering different things, he sees the box, grabs the box, he sets it down and he opens it. And inside this box are a donkey's bit to bridle. Now, at this point, the first time I watched this, at this point, my mind wonders, was this the bridle that Joseph used on the donkey that Mary rode to Bethlehem for the census and ultimately for Jesus' birth? We don't find out if that's an answer or not through this episode. We'll find out a different story behind that here in a bit. Now, at this point, we fast forward because everything kind of ends of course, the show doesn't show Jesus sleeping because that would be <coughs> kind of boring by Thank you. But they wake up and the next day, we're, we're there. We're at the day's festivities. Jesus and his mother Mary, or Emma Mary, greet Dinah and Rafi. And if we remember back, Dinah and Rafi, that was the wedding at Cana. That's where he did his first miracle, where he turned water into wine. Bless him. That was his wine miracle time. They also reunite with Lazarus and his sisters who were visiting from Bethany. Now the siblings, the three of them, have heard about Jesus' miracles 
and that some believe he's the Messiah. And in true fashion, Mary wants to ask. She wants to know. You can see the questions just wanting to come out. And of course, Martha, she's the, the stalwart one. She's like, not now, not now. That's good. Lazarus then suggests that they discuss this later in detail. Now, Lazarus convinces Nazareth Rabbi Benjamin to let Jesus read from the Torah during the synagogue service. And this will be, we'll read more about that here in a moment from Luke 4. But I found it very interesting as the rabbi's wife was with him. And she alludes to the fact that people are suggesting that Jesus is the Messiah. Almost outright calling him the Messiah. You could almost see that maybe she had a little expectation that he truly was the Messiah. Rabbi Benjamin doesn't say a word. Which I found very peculiar and odd because you would think being a rabbi or a religious leader, he would have denounced that. But he let it go. For now. Laz also talks Jesus into joining him in a game of Trigon. Trigon is a game, it's thought to have been created by the Romans, three people in a triangle, and then you have scorekeepers that uh, keep score, but you have to catch the ball or the rock in your left hand, and then throw it in your right. Now, who thinks that Jesus was going to win this game? He's going to win it right away, right? Little secret. That's not secret because it's on the show. His athletic ability was awful. He lost and lost bad. But it's nice to see his humanness in that. We were, we were always told that Jesus is both human and God. Well, we saw his, we see his humanity in the fact that he has no athletic ability whatsoever. Our episode then goes to that evening where they enter the synagogue and after Rabbi Benjamin says a prayer, Jesus opens the scroll and he goes to Isaiah. 61. And he declares it to be the year of, Lord, of the Lord's favor. We're going to depart from the episode a little bit here and read it how Luke actually records these events. Starting at Luke 4, verse 16. Isn't it interesting, too, that Luke was a physician? But when he came to the village of Nazareth, his boyhood home, he went as usual to the synagogue on the Sabbath and stood up to read the scriptures. The scroll of Isaiah the prophet was handed to him. He unrolled the scroll and found the place where this was written. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, for he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim that captives will be released, that the blind will see, that the oppressed will be set free, and that the time of the Lord's favor has come. He then rolled up the scroll and handed it back to the attendant and sat down. All eyes in the synagogue looked at him intently. Now, understand that Jesus was probably speaking these two verses with more authority than these people had ever heard because they were about him. Then Jesus began to speak to them. He said, the scripture you just heard has been fulfilled this very day. Everyone spoke well of him and was amazed by the gracious words that came from his lips. How can this be? They asked. Isn't this Joseph's son? Then he said, you will undoubtedly quote me this proverb, physician, heal yourself. Meaning, do miracles here in your hometown, like those you did in Capernaum. 
But I tell you the truth, no prophet is accepted in his own hometown. Certainly, there were many needy widows in Israel in Elijah's time when the heavens were closed and three and a half years and a severe famine devastated the land. Yet Elijah was not sent to any of them. He was sent to the, instead to a foreigner, a widow of Zarephath in the land of Sidon. And many in Israel had leprosy in the time of the prophet Elisha, but the only one healed was Naaman, a Syrian. When they heard this, the people in the synagogue were furious. Jumping up, they mobbed him and forced him to the edge of the hill on which the town was built. They intended to push him over the cliff. But he passed right through the cloud and went, or crowd and went on his way. A little context for this. It's important to, that we know that synagogues were very important to the Jewish people. During the exile, they no longer had their temple. It was destroyed. So these synagogues were places of worship. And during the week, they served as schools for young boys. They had multiple purposes, much like our space. Sunday worship, Wednesday Bible study, Saturday men's breakfast. It becomes like a restaurant. We have a theater and we have a four-lane Hot Wheels track. Serves many purposes. Is it any wonder why, I, why Mark and I feel like God is blessing this space all the time? <clears throat> Once the temple was rebuilt, the people of Israel, the Jewish people, continued to use the synagogues. And in order for a synagogue to be built, all it took was in a town with at least ten families. There were nine, they didn't get the synagogue. Ten, they got the synagogue. And each synagogue was run or administered by one leader and one assistant. And if there was not a rabbi, then it was the job of that leader to get a rabbi to come in, who would then read the scripture and teach. So it was not uncommon for an itinerant rabbi such as Jesus to come into the synagogue, read the scriptures, and teach. In verses 18 and 19, Jesus is quoting from our call to worship, Isaiah 61, 1 and 2. In the Old Testament passage, again, Isaiah is picturing the deliverance of Israel from their exile in Babylonia. And as it is the year of Jubilee, all debts are canceled. This, and we need to go back to Leviticus 25 to truly understand what the year of Sabbath and what the year of um, Jubilee are truly about. So I'm not going to read all of Leviticus 25, but that's where you can find out what we're talking about here. The debts are canceled, the slaves are freed, and the property is returned to its original owner. This is every 50 years, but property does go back to the original owner. So the release from Babylonian exile had not brought the expected fulfillment that the Jewish people were, were wanting. They were still conquered. They were still oppressed by the Romans. Isaiah must have been referring to a future messianic age. They were referring to when Jesus would walk. And we know this to be true as Jesus boldly announces in verse 21, the scripture you've heard has been fulfilled this very day. Jesus had proclaimed himself as the one who would bring the good news to pass. He would, however, do so in a way that the people were not yet able to grasp. They couldn't understand. It was, they were expecting something like Simon, or Z as he's called in the episode, the zealots to come in and take Israel back by force. But that's not what he was there for. And now here he is in his hometown, and Jesus would not be accepted as a prophet, let alone the Messiah. Verses 23 and 24, he says, you will undoubtedly quote me this proverb, physician, heal yourself, meaning do miracles here in your hometown like those you did in Capernaum. But I tell you the truth, no prophet is accepted in his hometown. The meaning of this is, the Proverbs is to prove your healing powers or to help your own people, not just others. And 
as I kept going over and over this passage, the one thing I could think of is there's a way for each of us to relate to this. The way that I relate to this is I've been told by my wife many times, do this or do that, you know, to get up, to go through a situation, what happened. And, you know, she's my wife. But then someone we cursory know, not necessarily a friend, but an acquaintance says the same exact thing. Well, that's gospel. I'm going to believe that. As a youth pastor, we did mission trips. I took the kids to, first year we went to Indianapolis, and second year we went to St. Louis. We wanted to get the kids out of this area to see what it was like in other parts of the country and what people were going through. When we were in Indianapolis, it was more of a fix up the area. Um, Diane and Krista went off with, with some of the other kids and they were painting. Um, we joined a group down at a, um, well, the guy was a gangbanger at one point and came to know the Lord. He forgave him, he, God forgave him and he forgave himself for all the garbage that he had done to others. And, and he moved forward and he built this huge gym and it had rooms around it where kids could go and study and they could go and play. I just remembered I broke my glasses on that one. I was sure glad I had extras there. But we also did mission work around Cedar Rapids because they needed to know what was going on in their own backyard. We would go, there was a mission that we would go to and we would uh, help out and clean up around there. There was uh, the Sunday meals that we would go and serve. One of the kids went home crying to his mom because he saw three young children come in, dirty clothes, didn't look like they'd had a bath or shower in a week. They didn't know where their parents were. They came in and they got a hot meal. This affected this young man to the point that he is in a profession now where he helps people. He has his doctorate, but it's his doctorate in, in farm, it's, he's a doctor, uh, he's a pharmacist. So we're gonna say something about it, that doesn't matter. He went and he found a way to help people. Some of the other kids, one of them, a gal is a women's uh, ministry leader. Another one is a pastor. These things help them, guide them on their paths. I felt it was important that they had to not only do things here in their own backyard, but go out. We, as Christians, should not be surprised when we're not accepted, when we're not understood for our faith, even by people who know us well. I have friends from high school that are, I love what you post on social media, but I'm, I'm, I'd love to do the same, but I, I'm afraid. They're afraid of what others will think of them. And it's not just about uh, standing up and proclaiming it on social media, because you can do anything you want on the internet. Good or bad, you can do anything you want. But when you live it out in your life, that's where it makes the difference. Those people, well, they know your background, they know your past, they know your mistakes. I have one. For, and I don't know where it came from. I thought I was a good kid growing up, but this person told me, Kind of surprised that you're a pastor. What did I do to cause that? Didn't ask, didn't want to know, just moved on. But they have blinders on. They're, they just can't see past who you were. Who you were, once you have made that declaration, once you have entered into Christ's family, the past doesn't matter. We mentioned here a couple of weeks ago, I think it was a Bible study about Kat Von D. Okay, she's LA Inc. She's, uh, she's an actress, she's a, a musician. She is, she's got a lot of tattoos. She's not the kind of person that, you know, you expect in this Christian's gotta be perfect world. It's so crazy. 
she recent uh, about a year ago she threw out every book on witchcraft she had she threw out every book on the occult because she didn't want someone else to have it she didn't want somebody else to fall down that pit and then she posted on her social media the video of her walking into church and being baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. She was a different person, but people cannot see past that point. They keep looking at her past. Your past doesn't define you, and I can't, Mark and I cannot stress that enough. The past does not define who you are. We have to let God work in and through our lives. It broke my heart when I saw a, a subsequent video of an interview with her where the harshest people to her in her change were not some of the people around here, but Christians. That is not the way the church is supposed to act. We be patient and we let God work in our life. This is how we can be a positive witness for him. And by her being patient and her moving through that, she is going to be a positive witness for him. We saw this in, in the movie that we watched not too long ago, Jesus' Revolution. A change. A young man becomes a pastor, a a. An, 60s beach bum becomes an evangelist. And they go through their ups and downs. They butt heads. Eventually one walks away from the church, but towards the end of that one's life, they came back together and Jesus came back into it. This is why we read and see in the show that when Jesus says these things, the people, the, their anger just boils over. They just can't stand it. This is the kid they watched grow up, a carpenter's son. How could he be a prophet, let alone the Messiah? And it didn't go unnoticed by them when he spoke two passages out of the scriptures. One was from 1 Kings 17, when Jesus reminds them that the Lord sent Elijah to a widow in the village of Zarephath, a Gentile, not to the Jews, but to a Gentile. And here he is, the Lord instructs the widow to feed him, and Elijah asks her to make him something to eat. And she tells him that she only has a handful of flour and a little cooking oil. He said, go ahead and continue what you're making, but give me some bread first. So she does. This was going to be her son and her final meal before they just gave up and died. But because she was obedient to what she heard the Lord tell her and what Elijah told her, she would have enough food until the end of the drought, until the crops grew again. Then we're fa uh, he fast forwards to 2 Kings 5, where he reminds us of the healing of Naaman, who was the commander of the army of Aram. Not a Jew. This one always interest, was interesting to me, kind of a side note, because Elisha doesn't go and talk to Nahum. He sends a messenger to Nahum and says, dip yourself seven times in the Jordan, you will be cleansed. Well, that was just too easy for Nahum. He was expecting something difficult for this healing, and he went off in a rage, only to be drawn back by his men. He said if it had been something difficult, he would have done it. So he does it, and he is healed of his leprosy. This just enrages the Jewish people in that synagogue even more, the people of Nazareth even more. And 
And so this passage in Luke ends with the crowd taking Jesus out to the cliff where they intended to push him off. Luke ends there, but our story in the episode continues. You see, we see Jesus backed up to the edge of the cliff, and we have Rafi on his right and Aaron on his left, and Rabbi Benjamin in front of him, and the people are behind him. He, he looks up and he says, Rafi, Aaron, Rabbi Benjamin, looking them straight in the eye. And then he says, this isn't going to happen. Not today. And if any of you are like me, you hear, you're hearing that well-worn statement that we hear a lot today, not today, Satan. Not today. Then, just as it said in Luke 4.30, he passed right through the crowd and went on his way. We watch him walk right through. And <coughs> the people whether it's Rafi or Aaron, Rabbi Benjamin, or the crowd behind them. God is in this production because they looked like I imagine the people of the time looking. They were either too shocked at what Jesus had said or they were just supernaturally mesmerized to the point where Jesus could just walk right between them all. Jesus then in the episode, which this isn't part of scripture, again, this is the creative license that they have taken, but it helps us to understand more and bring some more context into it. Jesus goes to the tomb of his father, Joseph, and we flash back to the memory of his childhood. We see Joseph teaching Jesus to read using Isaiah 61. They just tied everything back to the beginning. And I don't know that anybody else noticed that on Wednesday, but we had a little bit of a discussion. It looked like Jesus had a black eye, and, and uh, Lori had reminded us that the, Jesus had gotten hurt. And so it's all these episodes, just like the scriptures are tied together, everything is pulled together. These episodes are pulled together. And the two have a bonding moment. Now, who loves it? Who loved it when they were a kid and their dad would teach them how to fix something or do something? I wasn't real good with the car stuff. My brother was. I was more the uh, maybe hammering a nail or building something or working on a computer or something, things like that. But he gives Jesus the nail and he says he's going to have him hammer it into the wood. And this is something else not everybody may have noticed, but the, the wood that he was hammering into was a cross. He was nailing, putting a nail into a cross. What a foreshadow of what will be coming. And then as Jesus swings, because he tells Jesus, the men of this family can put that nail in it, one swing of the hammer. But I'll give you two. Jesus hammers, and he gets it about halfway in, but jumps and jumps back and, and, and in pain. He's playing a trick on his son. He didn't really get hurt. He apologizes. But then he points over to the box and he says, bring me that box. And he opens it up and Jesus is holding that same donkey bit and bridle that we saw at the beginning of the episode. This, this bit and bridle that I thought was what was used to bring Mary to Bethlehem. But there's a different story to this. This is a story where Joseph explains that this bit and bridle belonged to an ancestor who came out of Egypt in the Exodus. He further tells Jesus that this has been handed down through their family for many generations, all the way from the Exodus to that moment. And it was a reminder of God's past deliverance and the hope of a future deliverance. So this bridle was used to bring a donkey out of Egypt during the Exodus. A deliverance by God. A future deliverance is now inferred that this will be the bit and bridle that Jesus uses on the donkey that he will ride into Jerusalem on, on what we consider Palm Sunday, the beginning of the Passover feast. 
He tells Jesus that stewarding his life, being a father to him, even though he's not his natural father, that being a father on this earth had been the greatest honor that he could have ever asked for and that he prays that he had done it right. Jesus is still standing at the tomb when Zima, Mary, and Lazarus arrive. And they're relieved to find that he's okay because they weren't at the cliff. They didn't know what transpired. Lazarus has brought Jesus a bag filled with the supplies that he needs to go to leave, as well as that bit and bridle. Jesus explains to his mother that they had to, he had to say what he had to say, and he knew that it frightened her. And he knows that there's no turning back. This will be his last visit to Nazareth. It will be his last visit to his father's tomb. He also suggests that Mary go to Bethany too, just for a, a time until things pass. And then Lazarus tells him that he should come visit them soon, perhaps the next Rosh Hashanah in a year. We now know from our readings in the Bible, from the many times that we've celebrated Easter together, that the time to use this bit and bridle is coming all too quickly. There's no turning back now. Not after today. Are you willing to follow Jesus with that kind of resolve? Are you willing to follow Jesus knowing that there's no turning back. We need to move forward. And that needs to go into every part of your life. If, you're, if you've got a job or you're looking for a job, you need to continue moving forward, not looking back at the past and the way things were, not looking back at the past and the way things were like people will do with your life, but moving forward from today as a follower of Christ, not letting Satan in, not let Satan put his foot in that door and sneaking in. But moving forward. That means giving yourself grace. That means giving yourself love, mercy, and forgiveness. The very things our ministry is founded on. Give yourself those things. You deserve them as a child of the Most High God. Father, we just thank you that in this time that we can come together to you. We can lay all of our luggage, all of our baggage at the foot of the cross. You will take it. And we can turn and walk away into a new life. Don't let us even be like Lot's wife and turn our head to look back. Let us stay focused on you. Let us keep moving forward. Let us keep making strides in our lives that will enrich them. Father, we thank you for the message that you have been giving us throughout this entire series. <coughs> we thank you that through your message, we are truly healed. We thank you for all that you do for us. In Jesus' precious and holy name. Before we take communion this morning, I want to just remind everyone, if you grabbed one of these, not the purple topped ones, but one of the white topped ones, you have to open the small side first and get the, the piece of bread out before you open the top, otherwise you're going to get grape juice all over you. On the night of Jesus' betrayal, he took the bread and he broke it. He said, this is my body, broken for you. A little later in the meal, he took the cup, and after feel, filling it, he said, This is the cup of the new covenant, my blood shed for you. Take and drink. Scripture.
scripture reminds us that as often as we do this, we do so in remembrance of Jesus and what he has done for us. Knowing everything that is about to happen just prior to this meal, Jesus didn't wonder, oh, I wish I could have done this, or I wish I could have done that. No. He went and he washed their feet. He served them, knowing what was to come. We need to keep moving forward in the spirit of that. The body of Christ, both of you, take eat. The blood of Christ shed for you. I mentioned before, Mark is out of town. He's um, actually driving to Houston right now. And Denise has some things going on this week, so Denise and Steve aren't with us. So um, I want to use my uh, carpentry of things here and just to make sure that we do get everything that we need to pray for, including the, the both of them. We did get a text yesterday from Carla. A friend of her, Sandy, and her husband, Patrick, were on their way from Tacoma, Washington, back to Iowa. Patrick was taking a drink of coffee and choked on it. And before they knew it, they had rolled five times. The camper that they were pulling, all that was left of it was the wooden base, the wooden metal base of it. The rest is gone. They lost everything. They went to the hospital, and uh, they were able to get into a hotel. They hotel had mercy on them, but they didn't get a free stay, they did get a discounted stay. And they are now dealing with concussions, and they're not sure exactly what is going to happen from here. But we pray that they are able to find that, and to get that sorted out. We pray that God, they will allow God to be in control. I mentioned about Amanda earlier, just the fact that she doesn't want to burden her family with it. And it's like, that's not the way this works. I told her that she was on our prayer list and she goes, oh, you didn't have to do that. All right, she gets that from me because I don't necessarily always say what I do. I need to get over that. I need to share that with my church family. When you have something, you need to share that with your church family. If it happened this morning, it happens all the time, but I want to thank those that came this morning and shared some burdens of their hearts with me so that we can pray specifically for the needs of our church family. Lord, Father God, there are so many that are in need of you today, Father. And I'm not just talking about our church family. I'm not talking about uh, the people that we've just spoken about. I'm talking about when we go out the doors and we run into people everywhere, the need for spiritual awakening. Father, we pray that in order, we know that in order to have a spiritual awakening, there needs to be repentance. So Father, right now we pray for a repentance, a return to you, and then a revival. Father, we see pockets of that in different places, whether it was the college, the revival of the college out east, whether it was the concert down in Texas the other day where people are coming to know you, whether it's someone like Kevin D coming out and saying, I'm done with the dark. I'm in to the light. Father, we pray for those who are hurting, whether that is, uh, whether they're dealing with something mentally or spiritually, financially. Father, you are in control. You are the master physician. You heal us. You did that for our spiritual well-being when Jesus died on the cross. What we just celebrated in communion. Let us be reminded that each and every day that we have your grace, your mercy, your forgiveness, and your love. And that we truly, as children 
and yours are blessed beyond measure. We thank you and praise you. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. I'm going to go back to this prayer from earlier this year that uh, Mark had shared with all of us because it, it fits so well with this message and with what we're praying for right now. So pray with me right now. Lord God, in heaven, I pray for you to move against the forces of evil. Lord God, I ask that by your mighty power that you would bind Satan and all of his minions from every aspect of our lives as well as those of our family and our church family. In your mighty name, Lord Jesus, bind all the forces of darkness and disband them with your light. Throw the enemy forces into confusion, hampering their plans and shutting down their schemes so that they will not prosper in their rebellion against you and your people. I pray that any and all support of those who do evil in your sight would be dissolved. I pray that their hard hearts would be softened and they would turn to you, Father God. Because, Father God, we do not pray bad things for them. We want them to turn to you. We want them to be made right in your sight through the salvation that only comes by accepting Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. Heavenly Father, let us have eyes to see past the deception of the enemy, <coughs> past those who are around us that want nothing more than to harm us or to deceive us or to lead us astray. And instead of rebellion, that there would be a repentance, Father. Draw us ever closer to you, Father. Open our eyes to see that you are the King of kings, the Lord of lords, the commander of heaven's armies, the most high God. Lord, we send you, we ask that you send your warring and protecting angels to surround us and protect us from all evil. I pray that all the forces of evil that are working against the efforts of Grace Street Church, our church family and friends, would be bound away and they would be overcome by your mighty power. Lord Jesus, we claim this is a victory in your mighty name, and we know that by calling on your mighty name that you will protect us. All glory, honor, and praise to you, Father, forever and ever. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, and all God's people said, Amen. 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 For those of you watching online, please click the link and watch the videos. Take in the message, not just from the words today during the live portion, but also from the Thank you all for being with us this morning. Go in peace.